Hi everyone, today we're going to be talking about the evolution of isolated galaxies. And so what that means is we need to dive into the connections between a lot of the topics that we've already discussed and kind of put them together and kind of understand how they come together. So in a lot of sense, we're kind of claiming all the tricks, use a lot of the physics that we've built up over the past uh, several weeks to really connect together and come up with a picture for how an isolated galaxy is going to evolve. So without uh, going into too much uh, more introduction, I want to start out by kind of capturing a lot of the ideas that we have had in the past few weeks uh, and really trying to connect up uh, some of the time scales that we should have orbiting around in our heads, so to speak, so that we can kind of use uh, that information to just bear in mind the different physical effects that are uh, playing out in all of the gas and the stars that would play out uh, in an isolated galaxy evolving. So. I've pulled a lot of these timescales together here into this table that I've also uh, clipped out and put into your book. And I want to kind of illustrate for you several of the different uh, timescales that we have for um, uh, just all these different processes that are happening. And so I think we, maybe we should start here at the bottom. Uh, with the current age of the universe, which is in units, the common units of a mega year is 14,000 mega years. Our galaxy, we think, started uh, about uh, a mega year or gig year after the beginning of the universe. And the main sequence lifetime of the sun is about 10,000 mega years. And the current lifetime of the sun and the earth and the solar system is about 4.6 billion years or 4,600 mega years. So, this gives us a sense for like what the outer scales of the stellar evolutionary time scales are. Indeed, I skipped over the thing at the bottom, which was the main sequence lifetime of the lowest mass stars. This is way too long. It just goes to show that anything that is formed uh, now in a low mass star, uh, one of these like M8 dwarfs, will just stick around for far longer than the entire universe uh, has existed so far to date. Uh, as we look up uh, the sort of hierarchy coming here uh, to smaller scales, we'll talk about depletion times but uh, later in the uh, chat. But right now, the thing that I'd like to pay you to pay attention to is the orbital time for the sun around the galactic center. Uh, so this is 250 million years, which can be compared to the current age of the sun in the solar system. And that kind of gives you a sense of the uh, number of times the sun has gone around the center of the galaxy only ends up being about 20 to 18 ish, given the numbers I've picked here. So the sun really hasn't made that many orbits. In contrast, the Earth has made 4.6 billion orbits, because that's how we define a year. Anyways, uh, we can look uh, farther up here, and we see that uh, the these are sort of the stellar lifetimes at the bottom. Then we get to the dynamical times, and that 250 million years is just a good characteristic value for anything orbiting the galaxy. Uh, in contrast, we get down to the stellar lifetimes of high-mass stars setting the short end of our time scales. Uh, so the maximum lifetimes for stars that are producing lots of ionizing radiation and H2 regions and then undergoing core collapse supernova, those are a few tens of millions of years each. Uh, and that also gets down to the time scales that are typical for uh, the interstellar medium. Uh, so we see that uh, free fall time scales for molecular clouds, cooling times in the ISM, the expansion time for supernova remnants is about 1 million years. I think I said in the book that the whole lifetime before it merges in with the ISM is about uh, 400,000 years or 4.4 4 mega years. Uh, so this gives us a wide range of the different uh, time scales. So we have the star formation time scales are very short. Stellar low mass stars evolve on very long time scales. And then high mass stars uh, are evolving shorter than the dynamics of a galaxy. And so whenever we have this hierarchy of scales, it's useful to kind of think about them in terms of ratios. I give you one ratio. The sun's gone around the galaxy about 18 times. Uh, we can also compare that time to the lifetime of the highest mass stars. And here, it's only about 1% 
of an orbital uh, period is the lifetime of a high mass star. So that means those highest mass stars only make it about 1% of the way around a galactic dynamical orbit before they end their lives in supernova. Uh, so these just give us good kind of benchmarks to keep in mind the different time scales that we see in the galaxy. Okay. I want to start out, ooh, this is just going a little too fast, uh, with a movie. Uh, this is a wonderful simulation from the illustrious uh, TNG collaboration. Uh, that's the next generation of this simulation. And it's showing the formation of a galaxy. So this is really what we're looking at. Uh, and I want to call your attention to several different features here. Uh, the first is the kind of characteristic scale up here in the left-hand corner. Uh, the current stellar mass of the galaxy, that's not the mass of the galaxy, uh, that's not all the gas and dark matter, it's just what's in stars. The current star formation rate of the galaxy, so it's about 0.6 uh, solar masses per year. For context, our galaxy in the Milky Way has a star formation rate of about 2 solar masses per year. Um, maybe 3. Uh, this zoom out uh, shows dark matter particles. Uh, in the system. And then uh, these little insets here show the stars and the gas zoomed in on the center of the galaxy. And so what you're seeing here is a bunch of material. This is the gas that is flowing into this forming galaxy that's only about 100 million solar masses. So uh, our galaxy would get up to about 11 on this scale, so log m of 11. And so let's just sort of watch what's happening here as this material is accreting and falling in, mostly because of the action of this dark matter. So let's just kind of take it in uh, to uh, just take this all in. What you see is a bunch of material kind of just crashing in all together, and it's flowing down the uh, sort of orientation from this stuff called the cosmic web. And you can sort of see the structure of the cosmic web in this inset of the dark matter, and material just kind of flows together. And because things are hitting off axis, it builds up angular momentum. So two particles moving off axis and colliding with each other end up kind of splatting into each other uh, uh, and generating angular momentum. And as this gas sort of flows in here, we slowly build up a disk of a galaxy. And that's what you can sort of see uh, right about here. So we're going to take a pause in the simulation's time steps. And it does this nice little zoom around. And so uh, what we see coming in here, we have the cold gas on one side, and then we see hot gas on the other side, that green uh, uh, there. And so we just continue watching the cold gas come together. And you can see how these big galaxies get kind of bombarded and merged by all this material flowing in. But the inside is just a nice little galaxy building up, getting up to about Milky Way size. The gas is uh, floating around. And so this material is coming in in accretion from the cosmic web. So we see all of this gas uh, kind of flowing in and turning into this engine of gas and stars. Uh, and so that's what we really want to kind of dive into and have in our mind. This essentially does this entire course uh, for us uh, right here. Uh, with this uh, intuition. So this is just a fantastic movie. Uh, I'll have the link is in the textbook. And so you can go ahead and watch it a little bit more yourself. So really a fantastic set of insight for what's happening. All right, so what we actually see here can be abstracted out into this schematic diagram, which is in the textbook. So we have this little picture of the galaxy inset into the cosmic web, and a galaxy builds up its mass because it's gathering material in from the cosmic web. And when I say material here, it, the dark matter is flowing in, but also the key thing that's flowing in here is gas. If we have a star out there uh, that's kind of in orbit around our galaxy, Galaxy, it's not going to fall in because the stars are not collisional. They have they have a hard time dissipating angular momentum, and so they end up saying hanging out there in the halo of the galaxy, essentially in perpetuity. Uh, but the well until they end their lives. But 
um, the gas actually can flow in because it crashes into itself and it ends up dissipating its angular momentum, is able to sort of flow down and contract into this disk. So uh, the gas is flowing in and it joins in with the galaxy in the outer ends of uh, outer edges of the disk and kind of moves into the disk as it progressively dissipates more and more angular momentum. This is essentially kind of material kind of going down the drain. And a galaxy is nothing more than an engine that is getting rid of uh, angular momentum as material is flowing into the center. Well, a disk galaxy. So this gives us a picture of what's happening to the gas. And then what's important is what is happening to the other phases of material. Uh, here. And so the gas comes in and it undergoes this process that we call the accretion from the halo. That's really what this movie was showing was how material forms into the halo. And it comes in in uh, usually a hot state that is cooling down and uh, going from ionized to neutral. And when it does so, it joins the atomic medium. And then that atomic medium kind of kicks off the, what we call the matter cycle within galaxies. And so this is mostly the phases of the interstellar medium where the atomic gas cools down and gravitation collects into cold molecular clouds. Those cold molecular clouds undergo star formation within them which then turns on, it heats up the material, it ionizes it into H2 regions. Uh, those H2 regions rip apart the molecular cloud through the process of feedback and end up revealing a new population of stars. Those high mass stars in that population will end up exploding and uh, through supernova remnants, they'll kick a bunch of material back out in the form of hot gas. That hot gas will contain the products of stellar nucleosynthesis, more on that later, and then we will come back and that gas will start cooling down to form another cycle. So this gives us a sense of what the matter cycle is within galaxies and the connections between generations of stars. Uh, so I skipped over what happens to all the stars. During the star formation event, we form stars of all different masses according to the initial mass function. We get some stars that are low mass and we get some stars that are high mass. The high mass stars, we kind of already told their story, but the low mass stars actually kind of represent a loss from the system. They stop participating in the um, uh, matter cycle and instead the material just gets locked up inside these low mass uh, stars, which last for the lifetime of the galaxy or longer, uh, kind of uh, bubbling away and doing nothing. Intermediate mass stars uh, throw off some hot ionized material as they go through their thermal pulsation AGB phase. They give off some uh, material into the ISM, again, kind of enriched with uh, uh, metals. So that comes here into the hot ionized medium. But they also produce stellar remnants. Uh, they produce white dwarfs. And then uh, high mass stars can produce neutron stars or black holes. And what's interesting is that if these stars, uh, the white dwarfs or the neutron stars are in a binary system, they can actually have another chance to hop back into uh, the matter cycle. And that is through the process of uh, supernova explosions. So these supernova, um, well, the white dwarfs can co uh, collapse and undergo a thermonuclear supernova explosion, as we talked about earlier, and that fuses a bunch of elements, uh, creating a bunch of things near the iron peak uh, elements, iron, nickel, uh, that level. And then the neutron stars can spiral in in a gravitational wave event and collide together and form uh, cumulonovae and form the heaviest elements. And in both of those, inject their material back into the hot ionized medium uh, which then it can kind of participate and carry these elements here back into the ISM. Uh, let's take a look at the matter cycle in a little more detail. This is another movie. This is from the FIRE collaboration, which is, I think, Feedback in Realistic Environments, uh, which is really focusing on the effects of uh, feedback. And so this is a Milky Way style system or uh, type of system. And what it's showing is merger with another system that's about the mass of one of our satellite galaxies called the Large Magellanic Cloud. 
And we're going to take a look at what happens to that galaxy as it kind of gets merged. And I warn you, this has got a little bit of a zoom in thing as well as playing out the evolution here. So uh, yeah, um, it can be kind of hard to follow when we're zooming through the galaxy. So let's go ahead. So we are both zooming in and we are watching this galaxy spin. And as you watch, you can see the effects of feedback uh, where stars are blowing off uh, material in this high mass uh, gas. And this sort of shows the collision, which triggers a bunch of star formation. We're sort of swimming through the galaxy here. Oh, it's chaos. But fortunately, they decided that the camera should, would be better suited if it's kind of dropped out. And you can see the galaxy spinning around. And if you watch carefully, you can see individual kind of supernova explosions going off in the arms. And again, the feedback kind of kicking gas out. That's this bluish purplish color. Uh, so this shows the process of galaxy collisions and accretion, which we'll get into a lot later. And it also shows the uh, effects of feedback. Uh, the other thing that this is trying to illustrate is that when galaxies collide, they actually throw off a bunch of uh, stars in kind of a, a characteristic pattern. And those patterns stick around for a while because again, stars are not collisional. They are only processed through the gravity. And so you can actually see trails of stars around galaxies that are the remnants of a previous stellar collision. So this illustrates that last step uh, from, the, uh, from stars going into the hot ionized medium through the process of feedback. And we can actually see feedback taking place in real galaxies. So this is uh, a picture that I had the privilege of being part of the collaboration that collected. This is an image of a nearby galaxy uh, called M74, or the Phantom Galaxy. And uh, in this galaxy, there's lots of... Uh, uh, what we're what we're looking at here is the emission from polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in the infrared. Uh, these are uh, basically these tiny molecules that are embedded in the interstellar medium. They are being excited by ultraviolet photons, but not ionizing photons. And when you do so, these complicated molecules undergo normal mode, kind of bending and stretching mode excitation, to give off a characteristic kind of bright feature at known wavelengths that the, uh, this is data from the new James Webb Space Telescope, uh, that we can actually look at and see uh, where these molecules are emitting. Now, the secret to these molecules is that they're mixed in with the neutral phases of the interstellar medium. Uh, so that's the atomic gas and also the molecular gas. They're all embedded in it. They get it sh it, light shines on them from uh, stars in the galaxy and they light up. And critically, what this shows is, is where they aren't. And we can actually see the effects of stellar feedback in these holes where the hot ionized gas has blasted away uh, the neutral medium, leaving behind these big gaping holes in the galaxy. And we also have plotted here in this kind of yellowish orange color, uh, we haven't, the brilliant visualization teams uh, led, uh, really inspired by Judy Schmidt here, have really focused in on the individual hot um, uh, regions uh, in the band showing where the hottest uh, temperatures of dust are in the galaxy. And those are the places where we're seeing ongoing star formation. So let's take a look at these in a little more detail because they're these nice round bubbles, uh, which is what we call them in the interstellar medium. And they are not always so perfectly round. So if we take a look at closer details, we sort of see that as they uh, move away from the spiral arms, you see some more elongated oval shapes. And those oval shapes uh, emerge because of the process of shear. Um, so a galaxy is rotating at usually about a constant speed around the center. Uh, our sun is going around the center at about 220 kilometers per second, as is most of the Milky Way disk. Uh, that implies uh, that if we have a constant rotation speed, but we're in a circular system and are moving farther away from the uh, orbit, uh, from the center, the rotational frequency, like omega, uh, is actually dropping off with radius. And so if we have uh, a bubble here where we have something on, uh, on the inside and a little point on the outside, everything will be moving in the direction of galactic rotation at 220 kilometers per second, but the stuff on the inside of the bubble 
has a little farther or a little uh, shorter to go than the stuff on the outer galaxy, just because the circumference of the orbit is smaller for the thing on the inside of the bubble than on the outer part of the bubble. And so it appears to kind of move ahead while the stuff at the top of the bubble kind of falls behind. And this ends up stretching out the bubble over the course of time into ovals. And we sort of see those effects here. Uh, where these bubbles and these older bubbles kind of get distended and stretched out and merged here. So this ends up taking that hot ionized bubble and kind of pulling it apart, kind of like taffy or uh, a noodle uh, or something. It's gets stretched apart. And then uh, that sort of stretching kind of takes the hot ionized gas apart and it starts to cool down and get mixed back in with the galaxy as a whole. So... Uh, we see all of this uh, material with feedback uh, driving uh, these big bubbles inside the stars, but we also see some of the feedback kicking material back out all the way into the cosmic web. So this ends up getting ejected back out into the halo and indeed beyond the halo by these supernova explosions because we can get material all the way out uh, into the uh, uh, into uh, like very distant uh, spaces. And this carries enriched material out to maybe be incorporated into other galaxies. Now, the next thing we want to talk about is what we call the star formation law. Well, actually, before I go there, let me just say that uh, what, uh, what we're going to talk about with star formation law is the link between the cold molecular medium and the process of star formation. And this is one of the fundamental rules of the matter cycle in galaxies. And so the uh, star formation law is a statement that basically tells you how much star formation do you get in a galaxy given its uh, molecular gas content. And this has been measured a lot by, again, a team I'm very lucky to work on and uh, work with. And uh, we recently put out uh, this paper, which shows a plot of the star formation rate as a function of the molecular gas content. And this is shown in terms of surface density units. This is 80 nearby star forming galaxies. And we looked at one and a half kiloparsec patches within the galaxy and measured how much molecular gas is there and we divided it by that 1.5 kiloparsecs and how much star formation is there and we divided it by the projected area of that patch which is again the 1.5 kiloparsecs i guess pi d squared over four uh, is the actual area we divide by and that gives us sort of the amount of material and you want to divide by the area because you kind of what you actually care about is the amount of gas in a region you don't want to compare big galaxies with more star formation to low galaxies with less star formation so that's ultimately what we're doing okay anyways but with that as preface what we see, uh, these gray contours are the data in the system. The little arrows are upper limits where we can't measure things so well. And uh, we then fit all of the data. The, the contours are the density of the data, I should say. There's lots and lots and lots of points in here. And these lines are the fits to all of our data. And we find this is an empirical relationship that the star formation rate correlates linearly with the molecular gas uh, Basically, the more gas in a region, the more star formation you get, which kind of makes sense. Gas forms in stars, or sorry, stars form in molecular gas. Uh, so this tells us, and this, uh, the, I think the uh, important thing is coming up with this coefficient and discovering that the index here is 1.0. And since it's linear, that simply means that it can, you can define something that's called a depletion time. And so a depletion time for uh, a star formation is defined, de defined as the molecular gas content over the star formation rate, which is essentially how long would it take to turn the current amount of molecular gas in a system into stars at the current star formation rate. So this is essentially a distance divided by a speed. A distance is how much gas we have to go through. The speed is the which, how fast we're going through, and that allows us to figure out the time. So it's like a D over V kind of uh, time scale. Anyways, we find that that's about 2 billion years. Uh, and that's, that's an interesting number because it's not as long as the age of the galaxy by a lot, and it's not so short 
uh, that it just sort of implies that all of the gas is getting turned into stars all the time. Instead, what that implies is that star formation is inefficient. And the reason why we think it's inefficient is we can compare how long it's going to take us to go through all the molecular gas, that's the depletion time, to basically the fastest possible rate at which we could go through the gas. And that's the freefall time, which we discussed in the chapter on stellar populations. Uh, so the freefall time for this molecular gas is about 5 million years. And if you take uh, the 2 billion years and divide by about 5 million years and you do some appropriate averaging, you find that every freefall time in some gas uh, you go through about seven tenths of a percent of the matter and convert that into stars. So every opportunity when gas is kind of collapsing down, only about 1% of the mass in that gas gets converted into stars, and the other 99% gets returned out into the interstellar medium. The other interesting thing about uh, this short depletion time, or this length of this depletion time, is that it is shorter than the age of the galaxy. And so that means that the molecular gas reservoir has to be constantly replenished if we're going to sustain star formation over a long period of time. So we can actually form a very simple star formation law, which says that the star formation rate in a system, that's the m dot, the dot means the rate at which the stars are forming, is just an efficiency uh, factor. Uh, times the molecular mass divided by the freefall time. And that efficiency is about that 1% that we talked about earlier. So this is a really fascinating relationship that we're able to say, okay, we have a good um, kind of comparison uh, between models uh, or a good uh, def description of models in terms of a fairly numerically simple description of star formation. We don't know why things are inefficient. We have great ideas, and the models and the Starforge simulation that I showed you earlier in this class are really probing why is the efficiency only 1%. So we're developing it, but it's distinctly beyond the scope of this course as much as I really want to talk about it, like right now for hours. But uh, this gives us a good way of describing, overall, taking a step back, how we turn gas into stars uh, which then come out of this process with an initial mass function. The other thing that we want to talk about in terms of the matter cycle is its calling card, kind of its signature that says uh, matter cycle happened here. And that comes from the production of heavy elements through stellar nucleosynthesis. Uh, so this is a tracer, uh, really, of what a galaxy is doing through the process of nucleosynthesis. And uh, we are getting elements out of stars, uh, which is cool. So high mass stars end up producing a lot of heavy elements that they then happily contribute back to the gas in the galaxy through the process of supernova. In particular, those high mass stars make lots of carbon and oxygen and to a lesser degree nitrogen, really a function of the nuclear stability and this binding energy per nucleon curve. We end up exploding out into the uh, stars and they liberate those shells of burning uh, that were kind of at the center of the star. Uh, they get sort of shoved out by the supernova explosion. And because oxygen and carbon are stellar, uh, is are, are stable isotopes, as seen in the binding energy per nucleon curve, uh, we tend to get a lot of those, a nitrogen a little less so, uh, some sulfur, even some iron comes out of it. In contrast, uh, thermonuclear supernova, when two white dwarfs collide and undergo runaway nuclear fusion, they produce a lot of iron peak elements. They, those carbon and oxygen undergoes fusion, so we don't leave a lot in the C and O place uh, that high mass stars do. Instead, it much more efficiently fuses it all the way up to the nuclear peak and produces tons of iron. Um, it produces a lot of nickel as well, but that nickel is radioactive and decays down to the most stable nucleus, which is iron. <clears throat> So that gives us all of these light elements that are coming out of the process, and these big explosions happily return things out and mix them into the interstellar medium. And then we have this long tail of other things that exist in the universe but require energy to produce. So it's kind of weird. How would we get all the way up to uranium-238 or something like that 
from these uh, things that are starting with hydrogen? We think that the answer here is from the process that is called kilonova. And we talked about this earlier in the class as well. Uh, these are when two neutron stars end up merging. The neutron rich material creates an environment where it's very easy to build up heavy uh, nuclei, which then undergo radioactive decay and produce um, uh, a lot of the weird elements like the gold and the platinum. So this is really neat because the Big Bang starts our universe off with nothing in it except for hydrogen and helium. And then this process of stellar nucleosynthesis ends up creating this huge range of different elements. We've seen this plot before. It's the logarithmic abundances of all the different elements here. And you can sort of see where the spikes are. You see that there's some carbon and oxygen. Those are from the high mass stars. You get the iron peak, which is from the type 1a supernova. Uh, hydrogen and helium is left over, mostly from the Big Bang. Uh, a little bit of helium is produced in stars and released. All these very low abundance elements, your platinums, your leads, your uranium, all those are produced, uh, thought to be produced in the kilonova, uh, which produces uh, this trace amounts of tiny uh, elements down here. Uh, but nonetheless, this pattern is the pattern of a legacy of generations of stars. And so, you know, it's always cool to remember you have a deep connection to the cosmos because the very atoms that make you up are being produced through all these different channels of stellar nucleosynthesis and then participating in the matter cycle to get incorporated into the star formation event that made the sun and all of its siblings and then eventually integrated into the planet and 4.6 billion years later into you. So that's a deeply wonderful poetic Thought, and so we're going to ruin it by just kind of pointing out some of the observations that we make uh, that uh, pin this down. So uh, this is a uh, example that is how we trace the process of enrichment in other galaxies. It shows us sort of how, again, the calling card of the matter cycle turning in galaxies. Uh, what you see here is a bunch of measurements of the abundance of oxygen relative to hydrogen. That's uh, if we go back here, that's the same units here. We have a value of uh, 7.5 here in the uh, solar system. Up here is a galaxy with an 8.6 running around to an 8.4. Uh, here, oh, did I read that wrong? Nope, I got it. All right, yep, 8.6 to 8.4. As a function of galactocentric radius, this is M33, best galaxy ever. Um, and there's always a slope to it. And so we call these things metallicity gradients, which is the fact that there's more metals in the center. This is logarithmic, so this is 0.2 dex higher in the center than it is out here at 6 kiloparsecs. This is actually measured using the cooling lines of the interstellar medium. See, it all comes together here. Uh, this is comparing the cooling lines of oxygen to the cooling lines from hydrogen. And then if you control for the density and temperature dependencies of those cooling rates, you can take the observed light and infer what is the uh, abundance of oxygen relative to hydrogen. You also have to account for the different ionization stages of oxygen. Uh, but all those things come out and you can eventually figure out what the abundances are uh, in oxygen, and then map them out over the face of the galaxy, which gives you these nice gradients. They're always pointing down, uh, not always, but nearly always pointing down, and this is showing where the matter cycle has been most active. Because the more the matter cycle turns, and the more we get high mass star generations undergoing quick explosions and getting cycled back into the ism the faster this turns and this tells us something that's really cool is it's telling us that this is happening rapidly if we remember the time scales and the hierarchy of time scales the evolution of the ism and the highest mass stars these are all on tens of millions of year time scales and not the thousands of mega years that we expect uh, for a galaxy to evolve over. So it's the way that we build these enrichment patterns into galaxies. So what you'll need to know is just that we see this and this is a signature of uh, the different in, uh, enrichment patterns uh, in a galaxy. Okay.